Chris Godinas, licensed professional counselor, also the host of We Need to Talk with Chris Godinas. Uh, this video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, please go to Google, type in therapy, your city, psychology today will pop up, click on that, and it will have all of the therapists in your city. Also, the views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other goddamn therapist for that matter. Boom, shakalaka, done. Okay, so trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning. This episode is going to be on suicide and it is going to be on suicidal ideation, suicidal thoughts, suicidal gestures, why our abusers want us dead and what to do if somebody starts crying wolf and saying that they're going to kill yourself in an effort to manipulate and control. Okay, trigger warning out of the way. So before we dive into that, let me do a little housekeeping. So uh, you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make them cha-cha is available on Audible. Hola, como estas? It's there. So if you don't like reading, but you like listening, uh, please go to uh, Amazon, click on, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them cha-cha, or you know, type in, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them cha-cha, click on that. It'll take you to the book. It'll take you to the Audible. Bada bing, bada boom, there it is. That one is available on Audible. The what's wrong with your dad one is still being processed. <laughs> six months later by the guy that's supposed to be doing it. So Andy's on top of it. So he's going to get to getting that done. And hopefully that'll be done before July. Right, Andy? So <laughs> there that is. Also, if you are interested in mugs, I am selling them on eBay. So just go to We Need to Talk with Chris Godinas, 20 ounce coffee mug. There you go. Bada bing, bada boom, done. And I'll ship it to you. So, all right. Anything else? Oh, Eventbrite. So um, go to Eventbrite. My next book signing will be in Boise, Idaho. So on August 25th. Why? Because it's cooler up there in August than it is down here in August. That and I've got family up there. So it's wonderful to go visit and see them and be able to write it off. So <laughs> and see everybody in Idaho that has been asking me to come up and go do a lecture. So uh, go to Eventbrite. Go to the Mercury page for Eventbrite. Uh, there's going to be the, um, the lecture and the book signing and also the uh, VIP stuff. So please do sign up for that so we can start getting a head count so we can figure out how big of a venue we need to get and all that sort of good stuff. There we go. Okay, cannot think of anything else. All right, let's dive into it. All right, suicidal ideation. All right, so this week has been really hard because we've lost Kate Spade and we lost uh, Anthony Bourdain and, and Bourdain. And a few years ago, we lost Robin Williams. And why is it that celebrity deaths, but particularly celebrity suicides, seem to hit us so much harder than a regular Joe's suicide? I mean, not that it should, because, you know, we're all human and it sucks when somebody dies. But why is it that we seem to go, that can't happen? Well, I think part of it is, is that we live in this delusion that fame and fortune somehow make people fulfilled and happy. And that's simply not the case. Depression, mental illness, bipolar disorder, you know, things like that. They don't recognize socioeconomic status. It's across all socioeconomic status lines. It hits both the rich and the poor. It hits the educated and the uneducated. It hits regular Joes and famous people. It doesn't recognize fame. It doesn't recognize fortune. It doesn't recognize, do you see where I'm going with this? It hits everybody. And just because you somehow managed to be successful in business does not mean you're immune to it. So, this is what happens and it strikes us harder because we have this magic thinking that somehow, some way, these people who have quote unquote made it are somehow superhuman and they don't suffer the same foibles that us common folk do. Okay. And it's simply not true. Now, I don't know what the mental health status was on either Kate Spade or Anthony Bourdain. I do know that, that Robin Williams had some, um, uh, not just mental health stuff going on, but he had physical things going on that were creating depression. So let's talk about depression and let's talk about suicide and let's be open and honest about this. When Anthony Bourdain died, there was an outpouring of multiple feelings. So some were shocked, some were angry, some were sad, some were amazed, some were, you know, they were all over the board and it, it was, disheartening to me that people when they express their anger at him killing himself they lashed out at the person who said that and i'm sorry it's okay to get mad at the dead it is they're, they're not going to come back and haunt you and if they did i'd probably give them a piece of my mind for killing themselves 
Thanks for checking out, asshole. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's okay to be angry. It is. And, and it's okay to express what you are feeling, whether it is anger, whether it is sadness, whether it is understanding, whether it is whatever, because we don't know really what was going on in the minds of those people. Okay. So for the people who are left behind though, suicide is incredibly hard on them because we are left with the emotions. That person's gone. That game over. That person's gone. But we're left struggling with the hows, the whys, the wins. Did they suffer? Are, were they okay? Are they in a good place now? Is everything all right? Is every, You know, all of that. And that is why suicide is so devastating because generally, not always, but generally people who are going to commit suicide don't say a goddamn word. I've said this before. Listen to me now. Believe me later. They usually, the ones who are really truly intent on killing themselves, don't act like they're going to kill themselves. You, you would think that there would be a stereotypical, I'm going to kill myself kind of behavior, you know, depressed or, you know, giving away all your worldly goods or, and they do that. They'll give away their worldly goods and they'll be like at peace suddenly. And then the next thing you know, they've committed suicide. Why? Because they've given away all their worldly goods and they are at peace with their decision. Okay. So that's what I've seen. And it's, terrifying for the survivors because if there's no indication if there's no you know big ginormous neon sign saying this person's going to kill themselves we are all left sitting there going god what did i miss what did i miss what did i miss why didn't i see it why didn't i see it and that's so hard on the survivors and that's why i say that suicide is harder on the survivors sometimes than it would be for the person who suicided because the person who suicide is gone and now it's all the rest of the people who loved them that are left struggling and and trying to figure out the hows and the whys and the wins and the wheres and the this and the that and and driving themselves crazy and also blaming themselves so this is why suicide is so very, very difficult. Why am I not seeing the comments? Oh, there we go. Um, sometimes this computer really cheeses me off. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Um, okay, hold on. So where was I? Brain. <sighs> so much to cover on this. We are left with a shock for sure and, and trying to make sense of an un- sensible act because in the mind of somebody who has gotten to the point where they literally think suicide is the only option okay there are no other options so for healthy normal people when shit gets really bad we're usually able to go mm, okay this is really awful this is really bad but i've got this option i've got that option i've got this option i've got that option i can do this i can do that this this kind of sucks but i could do that if i needed to when somebody has gotten to the point where suicide is the only option, they get tunnel vision and all they can see is that one answer. And to their minds, it sounds like a really great idea because the internal dialogue is going, yeah, that's a great idea. You won't feel anything anymore and you won't have to deal with this anymore and you won't have to do that anymore and da 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 Which is why getting a control on this is so vital if you have depression, if you have bipolar, if you have any of these issues that would lead to possibly even thinking that suicide is a good idea. Now, the other thing that happens too for the survivors, and this really pisses me off, is you get a bunch of religious fucking nuts that say shit like, oh, they're going to hell because they committed a mortal sin. Go fuck yourself, motherfucker. I don't believe a merciful God is going to send somebody to hell when they're depressed. I'm sorry. I'm not buying that. My God, hell of a lot more merciful than that. So it, it, there's a social stigma is what I'm trying to say. And the families are oftentimes embarrassed to speak about it. And that's a mistake. That is a huge, Jesus Christ. It is a huge fucking mistake. We need to have conversations about suicide. We need to have conversations about mental health. We need to be having conversations about abuse. We need to be having conversations about PTSD and CPTSD. We need to be having conversations about anxiety attacks. We need to be having all of these conversations with no stigma. That's the thing. So, okay, hold on. There's, there's some, I think suicide is often a result of shockwave of despair. Yeah. Oh, especially for targets of abuse. And I want to talk about that because this, honestly, I'm sitting, I was sitting here pacing back and forth this morning going, how the hell am I going to organize this? Because there are so many 
facets to this topic. It, it would take literally five or six videos for me to cover adequately all of the facets. And I'm going to try to hit on as many of them as I possibly can. So yes, when, okay. <laughs> all right. So hold on <laughs> again, needing to organize here. When somebody has got depression. So I'm going to, I'm going to hit on that Angela in just a second, because you've got an incredibly good point. When somebody is dealing with clinical depression, okay, Clinical depression is when the brain can no longer produce and receive the proper amounts of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, all of the feel-good chemicals that let you know that life is worth living, okay? It's like the senders and receivers are not doing their thing. There is literally a brain chemistry issue going on, which is why antidepressants can help. Now, caveat, some antidepressants, especially some of the newer ones, well, some of the older ones too, but some antidepressants can actually increase suicidal ideation, thinking about it. So when somebody goes on an antidepressant, you need a professional to be checking on them every week or two, couple of weeks. How are you doing? How's your mood? Are you tracking your mood? What are your thoughts? How are you feeling? So when I have a client that goes on to an antidepressant, I make them check in with me. How are you feeling? What's going on? Are you tracking your mood? Do you have more suicidal thoughts? Are you okay? What's, you know, and if it's working and it's great and we've got a month out and it seems to be okay, I stop checking on them so frequently. And then when they come in, how are you doing? What are you feeling? How's your mood? Do you see where I'm going with that? So everybody seems to think that there's like this, this great pharmacological answer to everything and there's not. So you want to be careful when you put somebody on an antidepressant, you want to make sure that they are checking in with their psychiatrist, their psychologist, their counselor, their social worker, family members, etc., to make sure that that particular pharmacological uh, solution is not creating a worse problem, if that makes any sort of sense, which it does. So also, uh, people who suffer from bipolar disorder, okay, it's the high highs and then the low lows. So what happens is, is the brain overproduces serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, all of these feel-good chemicals, floods the brain, that's when you get the manic episode, and that's when, you know, I, <laughs> when I worked in the homeless shelter, we had this guy that insisted that he was going to, uh, and I was doing when he was off his meds, because he did this consistently, he was going to go to Hollywood and become the next big singer, and the poor gentleman could not carry a tune in a bucket if he tried. And then it would flip to the other side and he would become suicidal because then what happens is the brain dries up all of the feel good chemicals and there's nothing like you cannot get out of bed. You don't want to shower. You don't want to leave the house. You don't even want to leave your bed, let alone the room. So it's a chemical clinical thing, not situational. Okay. So, and everybody thinks, Oh, when somebody's bipolar, they're going to kill themselves when they're depressed. No, they kill themselves when they're manic. Why? Because when they're depressed, that's when they're having the suicidal ideation. That's when they're having the suicidal thoughts. That's when they're formulating their plan and they won't do it until they get the energy to do it. And that's what freaks everybody out because they're like, but they were so happy. They were so up. They were so this, they were so that. Well, yeah, but they were thinking about it for those three to six months that they were down here, you know, and then as soon as they had the energy to carry it out, they did. So that's why I'm saying if you know somebody who's got one of these disorders, whether it's clinical depression or bipolar, one of the bipolars, check on them, you know, make sure they're okay. Have them get to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a counselor or whatever, but specifically somebody that can, can um, prescribe. So in the state of Arizona, LPCs don't prescribe, but psychologists and psychiatrists do. So get them in, and uh, nurse practitioners, psychi psychiatric nurse practitioners do prescribe. So get them to somebody that can help them. Um, so that's what's going on with those disorders. Now, I want to talk about situational depression. This is what targets of abuse go through. So when you are in an abusive relationship, oftentimes there will be the abuser almost encouraging the person to commit suicide in one way, shape, or form. And I've actually had abusers tell their target of abuse, why don't you just go kill yourself? Duh, fuck. I mean, like, seriously, duh, fuck. And, and if they don't do that directly, the more, you know, crazy psychotic ones are the ones that are going to do it directly. They'll do it indirectly. 
they'll do things to place you in danger. They will do things that you could possibly get killed. They will do things to harm your health. They will do things to make you not feel good. They will sit there and put you down 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 to the point where you're like, oh my God, the only option out of here is to kill myself. That's what they want. That's exactly what they want. It is a wave of shock and despair. When we realize that this person who has mirrored us so perfectly was a lie, and we're left with the reality of who they are and it's horrible and they continue to abuse and continue to abuse and continue to abuse and continue to abuse and they've made us financially dependent upon them. They've made us emotionally dependent upon them. Sometimes to that fogged brain, fear, obligation and guilt, it looks like there's no out, but that's a lie. There's always an out. There is always an answer. There's always another way. It may not be pleasant, it may not be uh, comfortable, but there's always another way out, and it's not killing yourself. So hang on, let me let me take some of these questions here. Um, yeah, one per they say they're buoyant the day before, and then the person was not acting like they were going to kill themselves. Yeah, and it's because they've when somebody has made that decision, they've come to peace with it and they are usually really happy and at peace and everything's great and you know they're saying their goodbyes and you don't even realize it and that's what sucks and that's what sucks for survivors is that you're not even aware that that's what they're doing and that's why when they do decide to suicide it blindsides us and we're just like what the actual fuck just happened so yeah it's really hard um i can relate i lost two family members to suicide before i was 19. oh i'm so sorry they don't say anything it just happens yeah it's it's absolutely true um my uncle completed suicide when i was seven it has been so rough on the whole family and it continues to be and and it bothers me that we don't talk about it it bothers me that people are still to this day and you would think you know here we are at 2018 that we would be able to go yeah i had a family member suicide yeah, this person had depression. Yeah, this person had bipolar. Yeah, this person, whatever. But there's still the stigma. And and we need to get rid of the stigma. It's like it happened. No stigma. You know, we need to talk about it. And we need to educate teens on it. Because here's what I see. Teens' little brains do not finish developing fully until they reach their late 20s. Little humans do not finish developing fully in their brains until their late 20s. And teens are very impulsive. Teens are very dramatic, which is why you cannot give them a diagnosis of anything until they reach a little bit older because that's just part of the cognitive process. And when you have movies and TVs romanticizing suicide, that's dangerous because teens are very impressionable. So this is why I'm saying we need to talk to our children about suicide. We need to tell them that this is not a good, excuse me, a good answer. This is not, it is a permanent solution to an extremely temporary problem. Like seriously, like things that teenagers think are life altering and oh my God, it's going to affect me forever and blah, 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 blah. I can guarantee you five years from now, they're not going to remember. So it, it's, it's really important to, to talk to your teenagers. It's really important to remind them it, nothing is worth your life. Nothing, nothing, no person, no thing is worth your life. It's not. Hold on. Hmm. Okay. All right. More questions. Hang on. Um, okay. So again, this stupid thing is not letting me see questions. Um, all right. So it, it's not worth our lives. It isn't. And when we have TVs and books and, and romance novels and blah, 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 that kind of romanticize, you know, suicide or romanticize killing yourself or romanticize cutting or romanticize any of that stuff. It's not good. We need to talk to our young kids. We need to tell them about it. And people are afraid and ashamed to tell them about it, just like people are afraid and ashamed to talk about um, sex, which to me is just like, what is wrong with this country? Seriously. These things need to be talked about. If you want to make sure bad things don't happen, you need to talk about them and educate people about them so that they don't happen, if that makes any sort of sense. So, all right, hang on just a second. Uh, okay. Do, 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 do. All right, all right, I got that one. 
Okay. Yeah, my computer's being stupid again. I do not know what it is doing. So, um, oh, dumb computer. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, okay. Okay, so, okay, alcoholism. Let's talk about that. So when somebody is an active alcoholic, that is a bad combination because an al alcohol is a depressant. Okay. And if somebody has depression running in the family, if somebody has bipolar running in the family, oftentimes what will happen is people try to self medicate and they self medicate by taking, especially if they're bipolar, you'll find them doing a combination of like methamphetamine and alcohol because they're trying to regulate those moods. They're trying to bring down the high highs and they're trying to bring up the low lows, but it doesn't work because that, I'm sorry. It's like you can't be your own apothecary. And that's really what I see, especially when I worked in the homeless shelter, is that there's so many of the addicts had underlying bipolar disorder going on, especially if they were using an upper and a downer. So alcoholism is a huge downer and it does not get better. It gets worse and it does destroy the brain. It takes 10 years for alcohol to do what it takes meth to, I think, to do. Um, and it, it, it absolutely contributes to suicide. Absolutely. If there's depression going on in the family and somebody is an active alcoholic, yeah, that's not a good combination. Um, yeah, I'm Karen. I'm so sorry for your dad. That, that really sucks. So yeah, alcoholism is, is one of the ways that people kill themselves by inches. So it really, it is a form of suicide, but it takes years. It takes years. And that's what I tell people. And when I tell people that they get so angry, especially when they're active alcoholics, I'm not killing myself. Really? Let's take a look, shall we? You know, and we start talking about the physiological effects and the neuropathy that happens and the loss of memory and the depression and the lack of sex life and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it is killing yourself by inches um, when somebody is an active alcoholic and is drinking, 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 drinking to not feel so yeah, and they often do end up killing themselves. All right, hang on a second, more questions. Okay, so let's switch gears for a second. I am going to switch gears to abuse and abuse victims. So, or targets. When we have been abused, when we are in an abusive situation, it can drive us to thoughts of suicide. When I was 16, before I moved out of my parents' house, and I talk about it in my book, What's Wrong With Your Dad, also available on Amazon. When I was 16, I considered it. I absolutely did because I couldn't find a way out because here I was 16, no money, no car. How the hell do I get out of here? But thank God I had an older sister that helped me get the hell out, get a job, get going on college, you know, that type of thing. So we do. And again, teenager, impulsive, couldn't see another solution. I didn't go through with it. I just thought about it. Like seriously, like sitting out on the slide out by the pool at two o'clock in the morning going, okay, if I kill myself with a razor blade, will this work? And what will happen? And blah, 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 blah. I mean, I was thinking it through. I was totally, I had a plan and I had intent you know, I just, the only thing that stopped me was I'm not going to let them win. <laughs> you know, it's like, thank God I'm stubborn. So, you know, we do, we have those thoughts. And unfortunately, the abuser will use that as another justification as to why they need to control you is because, oh, look, they're unstable. They're da 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 you know, that whole thing. So yeah, they do drive us to thoughts of suicide. We do have thoughts of suicide when we are in the middle of an abusive relationship. We absolutely freaking lutely do. But you can't let them win. You can't. There's another solution. There's another way out. And the best revenge, honest to God, is what I found is to live well. It really, truly is, is like, you live your life, you go be happy, you have a life, you have friends, you go out, you experience new things. That's the best revenge, because killing yourself is not going to matter to them. Why? Because abusers don't have empathy. They don't have the putting themselves in another person's shoe cog. They don't. You keep assigning to them that they are somehow human. They are not. They do not have the empathy cog. They don't. They don't feel another person's pain. If they did, they wouldn't behave the way they do. So there is that. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So when we are in an abusive relationship, when we get out, or even when we're still in one, finding your tribe is huge. 
getting support is huge because that will help calm down the suicidal ideation and the suicidal thoughts. Because once we realize we're not alone and we've got a whole tribe of people out there that have been there, done that, and can help guide us through this, those thoughts tend to go away. Hold on just a second. Okay, and oh, and abusers cannot stand it when we are going through depression, okay? They want their target of abuse to be happy, happy, joy, joy all the time or engaging with them with anger, but they don't want us to be depressed because they can't cope with that. They don't know how to comfort. They don't know how to be empathic. They don't know how to feel. They don't know how to be a real human being, basically, and give comfort and aid and, and help and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They don't like it when their target of abuse is an actual real human because, oh my God, now they're not perfect. And then they make us wrong for being depressed, even though they're the ones that are doing things that are causing us to feel depressed. Hello? So yeah, it's, it's, really, hmm, it's really interesting. No, they don't like it when we're depressed. They don't like it when we're human. They don't like it when we cry. They don't like it when we show that we have got real emotions. You cannot be a human being around them. Um, yeah, black and white thinking is very, very destructive. Now, let's move into... Uh, what happens with a personality disordered person. Now, narcissists are not likely, not likely to commit suicide. Why? Because they simply cannot imagine the world without them. Seriously. It's like to them, well, I wouldn't kill myself. The world needs me. You know, seriously, that is how they think. They seriously, they don't do it, but I'll tell you who does. It is usually when somebody has got borderline personality disorder and it's usually an accident. Sometimes it's on purpose, but it's usually an accident. And here's what I've seen happen. So with borderline personality disorder, when you're down at the traits of end or you've got the quiet stuff going on, there's a lot of cutters going on. Sometimes you cut too deep and it starts, you know, really, you know, harming you. So um, that's one way they actually end up getting help is that they cut too deep and they end up going to the hospital. And then, of course, they see the, the scars all over their body and then they finally get help. But the, the other thing of it is, is that when somebody has a personality disorder and now narcissists will threaten, but they'll never go through with it. They'll threaten. They'll use it as a manipulation. So what they'll do is they'll use the suicidal ideation or the suicidal threats in order to try to manipulate and control the target of abuse. Let's say, for example, the target of abuse has said, I'm done. Peace out. I'm tired of being, being hurt. I'm tired of being harmed. Then all of a sudden, the abuser will be like, well, if you leave, I'll kill myself. What? So they use that guilt trip, fear, obligation, and guilt, false evidence appearing real, obligation, and guilt to get the target of abuse to stay and they use that you know well I'll kill myself and you'll you'll be sorry and and the kids will hate you because you made me Ooh, I'm sorry nobody can make you do anything yeah so they'll use that thought to try to keep the target of abuse with them so that they do not leave them so what do you do in that case <sighs> you call the police you absolutely you call crisis you report to them what has been said and you have them do a welfare check and you continue to pack your bags and you get the fuck out and you do not allow that fear of, Oh my God, what if I set them off? Oh my God, what if they kill themselves? If they kill themselves, baby doll, that is their choice. That is their manipulation. That is their choice. What you do is you call the crisis line, which I have the, uh, inter or the national suicide hotline up there on the title of this uh, video. I also have the warm line that they can call. So it is not your problem. You did not break them. You cannot fix them. And if somebody is using suicidal thoughts or ideation or gestures to try to keep you with them, that's a damn good sign that you don't need to be with them. That's also a damn good sign to call 911. That's also a damn good sign to call the crisis team and have them come out and do an evaluation. Now, if the person is still making suicidal thoughts or, or gestures or, or, you know, ideation to the crisis team, yeah, they'll be put on a, you know, a 72 hour hold or unfortunately in Arizona, it's a 24 hour hold because Arizona. So that's the point. And then somebody had said, well, but if you call crisis on them, then they'll learn not to say anything. And okay, then stop calling wolf. Don't, don't cry wolf. If you're not serious, shut the fuck up. Don't try to use it as a manipulation. That's where I get pissed because it's like, stop wasting the resources. If you're not really serious about it, don't use it as a fucking manipulation. But that is what abusers do in order to keep the target of abuse 
with them. Now, in the case of borderlines, oftentimes it'll be a suicidal gesture because they're overwhelmed and unfortunately, nobody got the note, nobody got the, the hints, nobody got anything and they sometimes end up actually suiciding when all they really wanted was the attention. And that is that is tragic. That that really just breaks my heart. So, so there that is. So that's what's going on with that. Okay, let me take some more questions. Um, I had one suicide attempt, 12 years old, so embarrassing. Wish I had gone, swore the next time I would be the last. Plays around with my head. Um, get with a therapist. So, you know, I had the thought, some people go take it a little further. 12 years old is pretty darn young, so, but there was stuff going on. So again, that speaks to an original wound, that speaks to what's going on in childhood, that speaks to the need to work on yourself and your self-esteem. People who love themselves, don't try to kill themselves. People who love themselves don't make that threat because we know what that will do to somebody else's head. So go work on yourself and it's okay. I mean, we've all, we've all been there, done that guys. We've all been there, done that. And it's just a learning process and it's learning that we are valuable and that we're worthy and that our esteem does not depend on somebody else telling us that we're worthy and that we need to be here. So there that is. Um, Okay, I thought it took at least six weeks for the antidepressants to kick in. Yes, it does take about a month. It takes about a month. Three to six weeks is generally what you want. However, everybody's body is different. And I have had some clients within a few days recognize, oh, wow, this feels so much better. Or conversely, wow, I'm having a lot more suicidal thoughts. It depends on body makeup. That's why the manufacturers say it takes anywhere between three and six weeks to really get it rocking and rolling, but some people notice it within a few days of taking it, depending on what the serotonin levels are and what's going on in their brain. So yeah, you wanna, you wanna watch for that. You do, you just want it. And when somebody's on an antidepressant, you wanna make sure that they're being monitored in some way, shape or form so that they're safe. Um, what are my thoughts on antidepressants? I don't have a problem with them, caveat provided I, what I do is I use antidepressants as an absolute last line of defense. So in other words, client comes in, they tell me what's going on. We do talk therapy. We work through the thoughts. We work on mastering this. We work on getting exercise going because remember endorphins, dopamine, serotonin is stimulated by exercise and doing physical stuff. So we work on doing all of that. We, you know, get them to go get a physical rule out any sort of, you know, physiological thing going on. And then if that's still, they're still depressed, then I recommend they go look at antidepressants. But I also recommend that they do the research and read what the side effects are and not just take the doctor's advice without having your own information. This is where people go south is like people don't research. People don't look up stuff. People don't do their own best advocacy. You must be your own best advocate. Why? Because pharmaceutical companies are pushing, 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 pushing doctors to do the newest, the best, the greatest, the this, the that, and the other thing. Okay, there's a, there's a lot of hankiness going on in the pharmaceutical companies with doctor's offices. It used to be, I don't know if they still do this or not, but it used to be we would have a pharmaceutical representative coming to the office because I work in a... In a uh, hello, chiropractic office. They would come to the office almost every week bringing lunches and bringing this and bringing that. And here, have your clients try this drug. You know, it was almost, it was first one's free. It almost was like dealing with drug pushers. I'm not kidding yet. And it was like, what? So I am a fan of trying things naturally first. I'm a huge fan of naturopathic. I'm a huge believer in making sure that the gut is working properly and it has the right, you know, probiotics and all of that stuff going on and um, working that first and ruling out any sort of physical issue going on. And then if it's still there, great. Now we can start looking at antidepressants, but let's look at the side effects because the side effects of a lot of antidepressants are almost worse than the depression. So some of them have incredible weight gain. I mean, one client I had gained like 50 or 60 pounds within like three to four months. Um, another one is loss of sex life. It just kind of makes you feel numb. 
you know, uh, that's another one. Uh, Prozac is notorious for just numbing everything out. Zoloft, too, numbing everything out so that you don't feel really much of anything. And that's not good either. So you want to be able to feel, you just don't want to be depressed. So that's why I'm saying it, when, if and when you feel the need to get onto antidepressants, do your research. Read up on it. What are the side effects? What are the possible things you need to watch out for? What are the drug interactions? What do you need to be aware of? Um, you know, things like that. There's a, oh, geez, I'm trying to think. So that's a, that's a depressant. I don't know if that's a, no, that's an antipsychotic. So like with Seroquel, one of the, one of the, um, that's not an antidepressant, that's an antipsychotic. It's also used as a sleep aid, but one of the side effects is tarchodyskinesia. Tarchodyskinesia is grimacing. So sometimes you'll see like, especially the older homeless population that got really hit with a lot of Seroquel when it first came out, you'll see them walk down the street and like, eh, that's grimacing. Eh, eh. And what they're, what it is, is that it's messed up their serotonin, it's messed up their whatever, and it's causing tarchodyskinesia, which causes grimacing. So you got to be aware of the side effects. You don't want to just blindly take any medicine without reading up on what the side effects are and are you willing to risk the side effects to fix the depression? And that's what I'm saying. There's a ton of antidepressants out there and I'm not a pharmaceutical person. I, I don't prescribe. I leave that to the psychiatrist and the psychologist. But I do know that there are a ton of newer, newer antidepressants out there, newer anti-anxiety meds out there. Sometimes the older ones work better and you just want to do your research. You don't want to just run out and go, give me the newest one that they just advertised on television because you just don't know. And you don't know how it's going to respond with your body and you want to check out all of the side effects first. So did that answer your question? That was kind of a long-winded explanation of what I think about antidepressants. I'm not opposed to them, but I am in favor of doing the natural stuff first and then using antidepressants or anti-anxiety as a last line of defense. So that's what I do. All right. Uh, okay. All right. I worked with my friend and she was telling me that she wanted to kill herself on Thursday. Then Friday she was okay. I know she is not coping but I can only reach and try and be there as she's refusing to talk to anyone. It is so upsetting. So Lola, what I would do is if you're concerned about her, do a welfare check. So there is nothing wrong with calling 911 or calling your local police department and saying, hey, uh, can I get a welfare check on this person at that address? Um, they've mentioned that they were not doing well and I just want to make sure they're okay. You know, you can do welfare checks. You can also crisis, call crisis and tell them, hey, we need to do a welfare check on this person. So people seem to think that if somebody does suicidal ideation, that it's only, you know, therapists that should be calling crisis or therapists that should be calling 911. No, guys, again, education. If someone in your life is saying that they are depressed and they are suicidal and they may harm themselves, have a welfare check done on them. It will do one of two things. It will either get them to the help that they need or if they're crying wolf, it'll cause them to stop. One of the two. And either way, it's up to them to get help. Now, here's the other thing that I have seen is that there will be people that will be, help me, 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 but they really don't want the help. So people hand them, you know, the crisis lines and the hotlines and the warm lines and the this and the that, and here's the name of a therapist and here's the name of a yoga instructor and here's the name of a naturopath and here's the name of, and then they go, yes, but, yes, but, yes, but they don't really want the help. They just want the attention. So that's a huge sign is when somebody absolutely refuses to do anything for themselves. People who truly want help will reach out and grab that lifeline and be like, oh, thank God. Okay, great. Now I've got somewhere to go. People who really don't want the help will be like, oh, that won't work. Oh, no, I've tried that. It doesn't work. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. Oh, no, no, no. That's too much. It's too expensive. It's too, too far. Here's the thing. You frame it in a different way. When somebody says that they don't have the money to get help or they don't have the money to work on themselves, I say, no, stop lying. Why don't you say the real thing? It's not a priority. Why don't you say that to yourself out loud? Let's see how that sounds. And usually when they say it out loud, they go, ew, that doesn't feel good. And I'm like, yeah, because it's a lie. So <laughs> it's a priority. You make yourself a priority. If somebody is not making themselves a priority, you can't make them make themselves a priority. 
Does that make sense? So all you guys can do is light the path for them, but they may choose to go hang a left and go absolutely off the deep end, and that is on them. You cannot force somebody to be healthy. You cannot force somebody to get help. They have to want to get help. And the sucky thing in our country is, is that there are no longer involuntary commits of longer than 72 hours. Why? Because it was abused. It was abused back in the 50s and 60s when wealthy oil men would commit their wives for years at a time, have them declared crazy, have the marriage annulled. Hey, they don't have to pay alimony. And they got rid of the wife. And now they can marry the trophy wife. So that's why involuntary commits got done away with. And we have 72 hour holds, which, or in Arizona, which sucks, is 24 hour holds, which to me is just like, oh, my sweet baby Jesus, is enough time to get them stabilized, to get them taking a meds. But then as soon as they leave, they usually stop taking the meds and then destabilize. And then we're right back in the same situation where crisis is having to be called and then they're hauled back to county. You don't want to spend time in county. Trust me on that one. The county hospital sucks, and it's a very scary place. So, um, yeah, it's it's a fucked up system. It really is. Um, okay. Yeah, suicidal thoughts absolutely can come with antidepressants, and that's why I'm saying you have to watch for that. Um why is the pain worse than physical pain? Because it's mental, because of the amygdala. So remember, when we are dealing with depression, the amygdala is involved in this too, because the amygdala is looking for danger. So this is not just the panic stuff, but it's also dealing with the thoughts that we had about the abuse and the replay and the replay and the replay and the replay. And that's why if you are having physical responses to depression, because Depression can be physical, guys. It manifests in aches and pains. It manifests in fibromyalgia. It manifests in migraines. It manifests in jaw issues, TMJ. It manifests in all sorts of you know joint issues, all sorts of physical stuff, okay? So if you're having physical stuff, start working on the emotional stuff. Start working on that as well as the physical issues, the physical manifestation of it. Yes, depression fucking hurts it does it causes gut issues it causes all sorts of issues if left unchecked so it's really really important to start working on yourself like really on all levels all aspects the self esteem the the uh disease to please the you know the saying no drawing boundaries uh getting yourself up and running holding yourself up and being accountable to you and not anybody else and not working on working on self esteem not other esteem that kind of thing um, I called a radio station to complain. They'd announced that Cobain had committed suicide and in the few seconds said something about his devil worship demon possession. I mean, suicide doesn't mean evil. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't. It doesn't. And um, the hardest thing for people to deal with is, is ignorant people's comments about the death. Hold on a second. So when I worked at the Dougie Center, and the New Song Center, which is a children's grief clinic. The Dougie Center was up in Oregon. The New Song Center is down here in Scottsdale. Um, it's associated with the uh, Hospice of the Valley. Great organization. Wonderful place. Um, it deals with kids who have experienced a death in some way, shape, or form. And sometimes, and especially back during the, uh, the bubble, the housing bubble bust, there were a lot of fathers that committed suicide because it was like almost like a version of the 1929, you know, crash. And so they couldn't see a way out. And so they suicided, but then that left the child to deal with making sense of why is dad no longer here. And sometimes the religious people would say horrible things like, you know, well, you know, they're evil because they killed themselves or God's not going to forgive him. And then I would have to undo that damage in working with the volunteers and in working with that child. So yeah, it does not mean evil. What it means is hopeless. Suicide equals hopeless. Suicide equals blinders on so that they can't see the other options. There's nothing evil about that. Now, like I said, people will be mad at the person for suiciding and that's okay because it does feel selfish to them. It does, but it was because they couldn't find another way out. They couldn't, they were literally not in their right mind. 
okay? Because somebody who's in their right mind can say, okay, this sucks, this is not working, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. Somebody who is literally not in their right mind is in fear, obligation, guilt, uh, you know, all of these thoughts, all this depression, not enough serotonin, not enough dopamine, they're literally not in their right mind. They don't have the ability to reason, okay? There's no logic there. They're not thinking things through, okay? So they're literally not in their right mind. And I do not believe that that's evil. I do believe that they are literally not in their right mind. And again, I believe in a merciful God, and I do not believe that God would send somebody like that to hell. I think what they do is they he'd wrap them up in his arms or her arms or whatever, boofa baba, I don't care, whatever you believe in, and help them figure it out so the next lifetime that doesn't happen. So that's my opinion on that. And you never say something like that to a kid. And that that's what pissed me off. It was like, who the fuck are you to tell your that child that their dad is in hell? How about you go fuck yourself sideways with an unlubricated baseball bat? Oh, anyway. All right. Um... So thought stopping, yeah, call for support. And, and it is about thought stopping. It is on getting with a good therapist and being honest about it. Now, if your therapist shies away from the whole suicidal thought thing, then that's the wrong therapist for you. I kind of talked about that last night when I was talking about, you know, what's a deal breaker with a therapist. Look, if suicidal ideation is on the plate, then that's what needs to be dealt with. So yeah, you go with a good therapist, you talk about it, you figure out where is this coming from? What is happening? What am I feeling? What am I thinking? What am I feeling? Where is this coming from? How do I work on this? How do I tell this voice to shut the fuck up? What am I doing? Do you see where I'm going with that? You want to make sure to talk about it and you want to get with a therapist that's not afraid to deal with it because I know that there are some bad therapists out there that are like, oh, I don't know. I'll have to call the crisis line on you. No, you only have to call the crisis line if they have intent and if they have, I, you know, the, the plan to carry it through. That's really when you need to call the crisis line. If somebody is just saying, I feel, you know, ideation, I feel suicidal. I sometimes think about it. Okay. Do you have a plan? Well, no. Do you have a real intent to do this? No, I really don't want to die. Okay. Then we don't need the crisis line. Do you see where I'm going with this people? So yeah, you, you want to get with a therapist that is willing to work this with you and walk you through this part of the journey. abso fucking lutely. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Self-care is absolutely, absolutely needed. Um, when we are in an abusive relationship, we absolutely have to do self-care and that self-care includes paying attention to what we are thinking and what we are feeling and how low are we getting. So this is the other thing I wanted to say. Suicide is often an expression of the intense pain that a person is going through. And especially when somebody is borderline personality disordered, they get overwhelmed. I talked about this last night. They get overwhelmed. They have all these emotions. They have all these feelings. They don't know what to do with it. And sometimes when I'm dealing with people who are, you know, grieving, when I'm dealing with people who have been abused, when I'm dealing with somebody that has borderline, because again, borderline personality disorder is rooted in trauma. When I'm dealing with somebody who's dealing with trauma issues, sometimes they will express the pain as I wish I would die. I wish I wouldn't feel that. And a good therapist will be able to, again, tease through, is this a real intent? Do they have an intent? Do they have a plan? Are they really going to carry this out? Or is this an expression of pain? Okay. And this is why it is so important to get everybody on the face of the fucking planet to recognize what they are feeling so that you can adequately and honestly and accurately describe what's going on as opposed to, ew, I don't like the feeling. This is overwhelming. I want to die. Oh, wow. I'm feeling intense grief. I'm feeling intense hurt. I'm feeling intense sadness. I'm feeling intense shame. That's why I don't want to feel it. Do you see where I'm going with this, guys? We need to have better education on emotions, and we need to have better freaking counselors out there that can help guide people who do do the suicidal ideation to help them use the proper language and what they really mean. They really don't want to die if they're saying it as an expression of pain. They just don't want to feel that anymore, and that's where things get into trouble for them because then they do get sent to county hospital and then they are less likely to say something and that's why we need better communication oh my god okay all right all right let's see uh, me and my children now are so open and honest about suicide my dad their granddad killed himself and we talk about it good not always sad 
talking is good. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be sad. It's 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 important to talk about all aspects. And it's important to talk with especially younger kids about how to deal with emotions and how to, when you're feeling yucky, what to do with it. And that, no, it doesn't have to be the end all, you know, the black and white thinking. It's all or nothing, good or bad, black or white. Absolutely. Um, narcissistic parents have no empathy for children having suicidal thoughts. No, they don't. Um, I wonder how teens could be educated to hold on till they can get out at 18. Um, Sticky wicket because you know when I was growing up this still amazes me when I was growing up We had parents that um, Demanded that they not teach sex ed in high school. I'll give you three guesses whose kids were the first to get pregnant You see where I'm going with that. So it, it really is needed. It's like we do need to have like a life course education on what to do how who do you call for help and that it's okay to call for help and again part of the problem is is that we don't want to deal with inconvenient truths we don't want to deal with things that are, make us uncomfortable and we need to be uncomfortable we do we need to talk about this stuff we need to help the people that are feeling so overwhelmed that the only way they can express it is to say I want to die and when somebody says that that's when you got to tease it out do you have a plan do you have intent Okay, if you've got a plan and intent, Houston, we got a problem. But if they don't have a plan and they don't have intent, then help them feel, help them express. That is the most important thing. And you're absolutely right. Narcissistic parents do not care that their kids are having suicidal ideation. But what they do care about is how does that make them look? Seriously, they'll care if it makes them look bad. <sighs> but there that is. Okay. All right. So let me make sure I covered everything I wanted to talk about. So suicide, suicides that happen with celebrities hit us harder because we somehow think that they're immune to it. They're not. They're normal human beings. They have emotions. Kate Spade did these all amazing, you know, happy colored, you know, designs and stuff. And you wouldn't know it from quote unquote, looking at her to know that she was suicidal or depressed or had whatever was going on with her. And I don't know because I did not have her as a client. So I couldn't tell you what was going on with her. But we somehow think that they're immune to this and they're not. And you know, suicide and depression doesn't, like I said, it does not know boundaries. It doesn't know, you know, rich from poor. It doesn't know, you know, famous from not famous. It doesn't have that going on with them. Depression is depression. And if the person is depressed and they can't reach out, oh, that's what I wanted to talk about. So Will Wheaton posted something and he struggled with depression for years. He, I have so much respect for him because he talks very, 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 very openly about his depression. And one of the things he said was, you know, it's great that everyone is posting the, the suicidal hotlines and that everyone's posting the warm lines and doing, you know, saying, you know, call these places, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But his point was when the suicidal thoughts start happening and there is clinical depression going on, the brain starts thinking in very bizarre ways. It does. It really, it doesn't make sense. And it prevents the person from reaching out. So a normal healthy person would get into a funk and go, ew, I'm in a funk. I don't like it. You know what? I'm going to reach out to my best friend or I'm going to call my cousin or I'm going to, you know, whatever to kind of lift me up out of this mood. But when somebody's in one of those depressions, they don't, they don't think of, of other ways to deal with it. So if somebody you love and you know that they've been depressed or they've got depression or they've made suicidal ideation in the past, reach out to them, check on them. How are they doing? Are they okay? Because like I said, that, that depression voice is going to tell them not to reach out. They're going to, it's going to lie to them and literally say things like nobody cares. I don't want to be a burden. That's the big one I hear. I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to bother anybody. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to call because it was the weekend. I didn't want to call because fill in the blank. So if you know somebody who is depressed or has um, had suicidal ideation in the past and they've kind of disappeared, check on them. Reach out to them because their depression may not allow them to reach out to you. Now, is it your responsibility? No, it's not. But if you are concerned, do it. Reach out to them. And, and I think that was Will Wheaton's point is that, you know, because of the depression, not every person who's got these thoughts or these ideations is going to necessarily call the hotline or necessarily call the warm line or, you know, reach out for help. So if you know that's going on, reach out to them reach out to them. How you doing? Check it in. What's what, what, how are you? What's, what's your mood? You know, that kind of thing. So I thought that was a really, really good point. 
Okay, so let me again review. Okay, so suicide in celebrities hits us harder because we think they're immune, they're not. Um, things that can cause uh, people to commit suicide are the, uh, you know, the un unmedicated depression, unmedicated bipolar, especially with psychotic features. Um, those things, um, if you know somebody with bipolar, you want to check on them, even if they seem like they're doing okay, because like I said, it's not when they're depressed that they're going to do it. It's when they're in the manic phase that they're going to do it. Um, feel free to do welfare checks on people. You know, you can, if somebody says they're going to kill themselves and they're doing it and you think they're serious, and even if you don't think they're serious, call for a welfare check. And then that way you've done everything you can do. You know, you can call 911 and say, hey, I need a welfare check on this person at that address. Or you can call the crisis line and say, hey, my friend has been making suicidal ideation. I really need a crisis team to come out and check on them. And then they have to go out. So anyway, that's what you do. And, and that's it. And you don't, you're not responsible for their actions. That is the big thing. So when an abuser uses the suicidal threat, okay, I'll kill myself if you leave me. That, that's if you leave me, you know, I'm going to kill myself, you know, especially if you're doing something that's taking you away from them. That's a huge red flag. That is a huge sign from the universe to get the fuck out. And, and if they continue in that, you simply call 911 and you have them do a welfare check period, each and every time. And usually, honestly, narcissists are not likely to do it. They're not because they are so arrogant that they cannot imagine the world without them. But they will use the threat. Absolutely. The ones who are more likely to do it are the borderlines who get overwhelmed and are cutters and, you know, can't cope and, you know, etc. And those are the ones that are usually likely to follow through. So, but, and, the good news is with that, you can learn coping skills with DBT. DBT teaches the coping skills so that when those emotions and those thoughts happen, rather than going to the, I'm going to hurt myself, I'm going to harm myself, I'm going to kill myself, you go use your coping skills to go, I'm feeling overwhelmed, here's the emotion, this is what I'm feeling, who can I talk to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there that is. Hold on half a tick. I want to make sure I got everything. Kate Spade may have felt responsible for all the people whose livelihoods depended on the brand. Yeah, it's a possibility. It absolutely is a possibility because people, when they have a huge brand like that, and they've got a whole bunch of people's livelihoods depending on them. That's a huge amount of responsibility and it can become very, very, very overwhelming. So yeah, it's, it's a thing. All right. So I want to make sure I've covered everything. I think I have. I am going to, oh, look at that. I did it in an hour. Holy cow. Um, so that's this topic this week. I am going to be doing another live one on uh, questions that I got over the last week. Uh, there was a lot of really, really, really good questions, not on suicide, but on other things. Um, uh, let's see. What else can I tell you? Don't forget to share these videos. If you think they are helpful, please share them with people that you think this will help. Um, if you are interested in any of the books, they are available on Amazon and the audible is up for, we need to, or, uh, you can lead a horse to water. Um, the cup is available on eBay. I think that's it. My voice is starting to go. I'm going to peace out. You guys have a great, great weekend and I will talk to you at some point during this week. Talk to you later. Bye.